uh, yeah, David Blackwell um, was the first tenured full professor, black tenured full professor at UC Berkeley. He was almost the first black tenured professor UC wide. Um, uh, so he, he was in the statistics department. He was hired in 1954. He was almost hired in the math department at UC Berkeley in 1942. And in fact, he was interviewed. It was recommended that he receive an offer. The faculty voted to give him an offer. Um, but to quote David Blackwell, you could, you could find this interview yourself on YouTube. Just search for David Blackwell Berkeley interview. Um, after it was decided that he should get the job, um, the chair went home and the chair of the math department went home and told his wife. And it had been a tradition up until that point that um, the chair would invite all the math faculty to their home to have to, for a meal. And uh, the chair's wife said, uh, I don't want a darkie in my house. So uh, they actually ended up not giving him the offer and they gave the offer to someone else. Um, but, but yeah, he, he ended up getting an offer later from the statistics department about 12 years later in 1954. And, and you know, he's a kind of well-celebrated famous probabilist and statistician. Yeah, so I, I just moved to UC Berkeley as a faculty member here about a year and a half ago. And uh, prior to that, I already had some friends who were professors in the UC system. For example, Todd Coleman, he's currently at UC San Diego, that, though he's soon going to move to Stanford. I've known him since I was a sophomore in college. Um, he and I were in the same real analysis class. Uh, he was, I think he was a grad student at the time, I was a sophomore. Um, and Wilfred Gangbo, he's a math professor at UCLA. Um, I've known him for maybe a, a couple of years. I met him at a, a CARMS conference. CARMS is a conference organized by Professor Bill Massey at Princeton. So anyway, they, um, they're people I knew and they knew that I was coming. And when I came, they reached out to me and they said, hey, Jelani, we're thinking of starting some kind of summer research program in the mathematical sciences. Would you like to join us? Um, so really it's the two of them who came up with the idea. And then I tacked on at the end. Our hope is that we increase the number of, of Black students pursuing PhDs in the mathematical sciences. Um, and so we'll see. I mean, that's our goal. Yeah, so they'll be doing math, you know, research in the mathematical sciences mentored by one of the three of us. Um, so if for those students whose mentor is either Todd or Wilfred, they'll be in Los Angeles doing work, you know, working on the research at the UCLA campus, on, on the UCLA campus. And then for those that I'm mentoring, they'll come to Berkeley. At the end of the summer, we're also gonna have like a unified event where we're just gonna be at the Simons Institute. Um, thank you, Simons. Um, so th those who are in LA will, will come up to, to Berkeley and all of us will, will have time at Simons where people will present their research to each other that they've done over the summer and also have some invited speakers talk to them. Students who I advise will be working on topics in theoretical computer science, which is, which is my research area. Each mentor does things a little bit differently. I can tell you, for me, in the past when I've mentored undergraduate research, I, I usually will give the students several different um, kind of broad topics and then ask them which one sounds most appealing to them. And then once they identify one that sounds appealing, I'll, I'll give them some more refined details. And then if they want to change their mind early on, they can. In terms of eligibility, any, any undergraduate who's studying at a US institution, regardless of gender or race or anything else is eligible to apply. Um, and applications should be received by uh, January 31st, 2021 to receive full consideration. If you want to apply, the application website is already up. Just search for David Blackwell, Google for David Blackwell Summer Research Institute. and um, you'll find it'll be either the first or second link. It's a UCLA website. It's math, it's off of math.ucla.edu. Yeah, so I mean, regarding the representation of black students in PhD programs in the mathematical sciences, there is some public data. For example, in computer science, there's the annual CRA Talby survey. And then uh, in, in, in math and the mathematical and statistical sciences, there's the AMS annual survey. 
Um, so if you look at the most recent of those two surveys for CRA, which is the computer science one, they break things down by category, like computer science, computer engineering, and I forgot what the other one is. But if you look at computer science and you look at you know, the percentage of US citizens, um, I don't know, sorry, that's not exactly. So it's look at the percentage of PhD recipients in the latest survey that year um, who were black US citizens. So that's 0.9%, um, so it's quite low. And then if you look at um, the AMS one, they, they measure it a little bit differently. They don't look at what percent of all PhD recipients were black US citizens, um, which would include, you know, then the percentage, the denominator would include for, you know, for nationals as well, right? Not uh, non-US citizens, but um, they look at, if you just zoom in on the US citizens, what percentage of those receiving PhDs were black. Um, and in the latest survey, it was like 2.9%, a little under 3%. So the numbers are not that, that high. Um, and, you know, regarding, uh, you know, hoping that the program might help to increase those numbers. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, it's, you, you just see it kind of empirically everywhere, in your, you know, anecdotally in your life, right? Like, um, you know, I used to, when, when, I, when we lived in Boston, my, when me and my wife, our family lived in Boston, you know, we used to go to an Egyptian Coptic church. And there was this like abundance of, well, first of all, a lot of people who attended our church um, were college age, you know, grad school or undergrad. And there was this overabundance of people who were either in dental school or um, we're thinking of going to dental school after undergrad, right? And I mean, that's just, that's one example, but, you know, I, I as a kid, I had never even thought of being a dentist. Not, not that there's anything wrong with being a dentist, but the idea just wasn't in my head. But, you know, there's, there's always this, I guess, network influence, you know, it could be church, it could be your, your neighborhood, it could be other, you know, other things, but just whoever is surrounding you, you see what they were doing and somehow that gives you the idea to, to pursue, to at least look into doing a similar thing. So our hope is by, you know, by seating people, uh, by seating more black students to who are going into this, it might inspire more people to do it. And I mean, I, I see another place too, like ge another example of a geographic seating is you look at something like the, the IOI, um, it's a high school competition. And, you know, you look at, this data is public, you can look it up yourself. Um, the organization that selects and trains the team that represents America every year is called the USA Computing Olympiad, USACO. You look at their website, and every every summer they list all the students who have made it to the final training camp. You know, and then once they're in the camp, they then go through additional contests to figure out who's going to be on the actual team because every country can only pick four people to be on the team. But you know, you look at who's made it to that camp over the last decade. All that information is on their website. Um, you know, I made a spreadsheet for each one, and I I, uh, I I wrote down their name, what grade they were in, and um, where they did their high school, where, where, what, what state their high school was in. And, you know, there, there are approximately 120 distinct kids who made it to that camp over the last decade. Some kids made it multiple times. That's why I say distinct. Um, and of that roughly 120, 60 went to high school in California. And from that 60, 57, um, so almost all the Californians are from the Bay Area. And when you look at where in the Bay Area they're from, they're almost entirely from the South Bay. So San Jose, Palo Alto, you know, around that area. Not that many from San Francisco or, the, or Oakland or Berkeley, et cetera. So, you know, it's, you look at that and you say, well, is it, is it because all the smart kids are in America or, you know, or half the smart kids in America live within a small radius of San Jose? Uh, probably not, right? Um, it's just, uh, just network influence, right? So those kids have, once they have the inertia and you know enough kids know about it, they tell their friends and then they get into it. And now there's a culture down there of, of aiming for this camp. And there, there are also extracurricular programs that these kids enroll in um, to train further, right? So, um, I mean, I think that's, that's what I mean when I say kind of network influence, just um, people do what they, what's around them. For me personally, the way I got into computer science is somewhat accidental. I mean, I, 
I got a Nintendo Entertainment System for my fourth birthday, and I played a lot of games. And you know, over the years, as, as a little kid, I I later got you know a Super Nintendo and a Genesis and a Sega CD and a Neo Geo and a Game Boy, Game Gear, etc. I, I was playing games all the time. Um, and eventually I got a computer that was probably, you know, I was probably like nine or something or 10. And eventually I got the internet okay, at home. And that was a big deal. I mean, it was not easy because we only had one phone line and this was in the days of dial up. So I couldn't be online while, you know, my mom or dad were using the phone. And, and also there were no lo local dial up numbers for Prodigy or America Online, et cetera. I had to call long distance to Puerto Rico. I'm from the Virgin Islands, so I had to call long distance to Puerto Rico. That was the closest access point for any dial-up internet. So, you know, back then I think di long distance dial calling was like 10 cents a minute, something like that. So in addition to paying the monthly fee for, to the ISP, we were also paying a lot of money per minute to be online. Uh, but, you know, I did it. My parents allowed me. Um, and, you know, eventually, uh, being online enough and playing games, eventually, you know, I, I realized that there's something called HTML, and that's that's how you make websites. Um, so I bought a book on HTML um, from the mainland U.S. on it when we went on a trip there, <clears throat> and I and I just read it, and then I used to make websites to practice, um, and then later, uh, let's see, in high school, so I was 16. We went on another trip to the mainland US and I bought books on C and C++. So at some point after making enough websites, I guess I realized, well, you can't use HTML to make programs. Like these games I'm playing are, were not coded up in HTML, right? HTML is working web pages. So I, I figured out that to make games, you need to know a programming language like C. Um, so once I found that out and you know, I bought these books on C and C++, um, I read them from cover to cover. And I would give myself would give myself programming exercises in high school, and also in twelfth grade, I had a computer science teacher um, who who taught us some basic as well. So I learned a little bit of basic from that. But I was already into C and C plus plus just from my own reading. Um, I remember after I got into MIT as a senior in high school, I went to the visit day, and I sat in on a linear algebra class. And um, that day, they happened to be covering, covering Kramer's rule to, to compute determinants of matrices. And I, you know, I didn't know about determinants or Kramer's rule, but I, I learned from that lecture. And when I went home, I remember I gave it to myself as an exercise to implement determinant computation using Kramer's rule, which turns out to not be very efficient. It's an exponential time algorithm. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know, you know better back then. I didn't know about efficient algorithms. So, but that was, that was a good introduction anyway to recursion because uh, Kramer's rule is a, is a recursive thing. By the way, I eventually did find out about prog uh, competitive programming when I got to college. I got to college and um, you know, MIT attracts a lot of these Olympiad type kids who did IMO and IOI, et cetera. So I found out from them and a couple of my friends told me about a website called Top Coder when I was in college. And I got really into Top Coder. Um, it's a competitive programming website. Nowadays, I think Code Forces is, is more popular, but back then it was Top Coder. But I remember there was a summer where I was spending more than eight hours a day just doing practice algorithmic problems on online judge websites. And the weekends, my weekends were almost entirely like practicing um, algorithmic problems online. So for me, it was for me it was like a game. Um, so if, if only I had known about this algorithmic competitive programming game back in high school, I probably would have gotten really into it. But instead, I was playing other games like. Ultima Online and StarCraft and Diablo. As a professor, what I often see is students who have high exposure coming in and able to get into research and advanced coursework early, right? So um, I've advised multiple students in research you know, during their freshman year or immediately after their freshman year. I even once mentored a high school student in research, and we wrote a preprint together with, with my postdoc. Um, and he, he's someone who, he was on the IOI team for Singapore. But you know what these students have in common is early exposure. Um, and there are a lot of kids who come to college, they wanna do math, they wanna do computer science, but 
they come to college not even knowing what a proof is or not knowing how to write a line of code, which by the way is fine. I actually arrived at college not knowing what a proof was. I, I first learned what a proof by contradiction was my freshman year in college. Um, but you know, that means that you, you know you don't you don't get familiar with with um, you don't get the mathematical maturity you know required to pursue more advanced research in the mathematical sciences until later in your undergrad career. And you know, by the time you're applying to grad school, you know, you're, well, by the time by the time you have enough mathematical maturity to to try to do research, you you know, you're you're a senior, right? And then you're applying to grad school, and then you don't have you don't have the same CV that someone with early exposure had. So someone with early exposure, they know what research is, they know what proofs are, they show up in college, they're already looking for research opportunities their freshman year. By the time they're a senior. Um, they have publications out maybe, right? Or at least they've done more serious, they've written a, some serious survey. They have a good undergraduate thesis in pure math or, or in something that's mathematical. Um, so I think because, because the college experience is time limited, right? It's four years. And really, if you're applying for grad school at, during senior year, then really it's only three years. It's right, because as soon as senior year starts, once, you know, at the end of the semester, first semester, you're already applying to grad school. So um, I think more can be done in terms of early exposure. Um, for example, train kids for things like the IMO and IOI. You know, half the kids that are trying to make the IOI team shouldn't be coming from the Bay Area. That doesn't really make any sense. In fact, uh, if you look at if you look at the again, I have I have the data. I got it off the website. Um, in the last decade, something like 24 states out of 50 sent zero kids to the national training camp for the IOI. Um, and states that are big and populous like New York, you would expect New York to actually send a large number. No, New York sent five or less than five in the last decade compared to California, which sent 60. Um, so, and I mean, it's not, it's not, so it's not, it's not just about um, wealth or, or, you know, or other things. I mean, it's, it's really network influence, right? There are plenty of there are plenty of wealthy people in New York who can afford to have their kids trained well for this kind of thing. Uh, but you know you don't you just don't see them coming out of New York like you like the like you see them coming out of California or Virginia. Virginia also does very well. And almost all the Virginians who make it to the camp come from one high school. So all but one in the last decade in Virginia, something like 13 or so out of 14 came from Thomas Jefferson High School of Science and Technology. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so going out into the world, um, giving talks to high school students, you know, here in Berkeley, we have the Berkeley Math Circle. So I, I once gave a talk to them on an algorithm for fast integer multiplication. Um, but it doesn't have to, you know, or if you want to do more than just a talk, I think, you know, that's, that's a very lightweight way to make, to have influence, give a talk, right? If you can do more though, make a program, make a summer camp, you know, um, that tries to reach kids early and get them exposed to what math is really about or what theoretical computer science or whatever is really about. 